glad you guys are here today. Thank you for joining us, whether you're here in person or online. Obviously, this morning it's going to look a little different uh, than normal. Um, and so before we get into that, and I did not do this first service, but I wanted to make sure I did this <clears throat> second service. I, I wanted to thank you guys who've been continuing to pray for me. Uh, if you've been here over the last few weeks, you know that I have had Bell's palsy. Uh, the right side of my face has experienced some paralysis. It is significantly better today. Uh, I know like last week, pronouncing the letter F was really hard, but I could say like 45 Pharisees went to the farmer's market to buy figs from the Philistines, right? <laughs> Without any problems. I've been saying that a lot, so I practice. That's not the first time I said that. Um, uh, but, but getting much, much better, it's, it's easier to, to, to speak um, a lot easier. So thank you so much for your prayers. Uh, this morning, we're actually going to do something a little different for us. Um, and I wanted to kind of share a little bit of the backstory of where it came about. And with that, I'm going to actually sit down and join the rest of these guys. Um, where it started is a few uh, months ago, we were, uh, Josh, Jake, and I were at our life group, and we, uh, we started having a, a discussion about a passage of scripture that both Josh and Jake had read or heard teachings about or taught over the past week and how they came to it from very different perspectives, right? Neither one of them were wrong. They were just a different understanding of application uh, of this, this passage of Scripture. And uh, kind of some of the commentary was like, hey, it's so cool that, that we can both be reading the same thing and get something different out of it. Uh, well, as we've been in this series on Masterclass, this, this passage actually came up uh, as the next, next part of Luke uh, in Luke chapter 8 that we're uh, teaching through. And so with that, last week we kind of had the idea and started talking about what would it look like if instead of a sermon, instead of me just preaching, we had an open discussion between our eldership, which this is representation, this is our eldership, um, on this passage. And so as we started talking about it, we kind of all thought, hey, this is a great idea. And we thought that, hey, let's do it. Uh, and so that's what we're going to do this morning. Uh, we're going to kind of share some different, uh, what we glean out of this passage, uh, and then kind of have some open discussion about it. Um, it is not pre-planned. Uh, we did this first service and second service. We don't know if it's going to go the same or not. Uh, I gave them my little notes that I have, but I have no, I, I have a little bit of an idea now after first service, but before first service, I had no idea what they were going to say. Um, and so our goal is just to have a conversation about uh, this passage of scripture. So if you have your Bibles, you can flip over to uh, Luke chapter 8. We're going to jump into verse 4 here in just a second. Uh, before we do, I want to share a story with you to kind of set this scene of what we're going to be talking about. Uh, most of you or many of you know that I am not a Colorado native. Uh, I uh, actually grew up in Texas and specifically West Texas. Um, and for all of you who think like Texas is so hot and humid, you're correct on the hot part, but all the places I have lived have not been humid. They have been like bone dry, like no moisture ever. Uh, what'd you say? So this is drier. This is drier, but like, I didn't live, I guess we lived in East Texas, that was humid. Uh, but like, where I lived in West Texas, like, bone dry. Um, but it's also, for some reason, the climate is perfect for growing cotton. Because the, the like, twice a year it does rain is right when cotton needs it to. Um, or they build irrigation systems now, everyone has an irrigation system. Um, and so where I was growing up in, in this small West Texas town of Lubbock, a, a brownfield, uh, Cotton is the greatest source of industry in the area. And I remember as a really young child driving to visit our grandparents, my dad actually stopped on the side of the road and picked cotton for us to play with in the back seat, and which was kind of cool. You know, we're playing with cotton and that was fun. Uh, my dad did not know to his doom, like every time we drive by a cotton field for the rest of all eternity, we were going to ask him to stop and pick cotton for us, um, which he did not do ever again, uh, just so we're clear. Uh, but growing up, like I even remember as an elementary age kid, when, when I had friends whose dads were farmers, they would pay us money to go in the cotton fields and hoe weeds. Um, and it was painful, backbreaking, hot work, and you did it once, you got some good money, and then like you never wanted to do it again until you got really broke. That's when you really, really would go and do it again. Uh, I didn't mention that first service. That's how they got me again, uh, as I ran out of money. But with this idea is, is when you're driving in West Texas, and especially uh, when cotton is getting close to harvest, right, in the fall. You always know it's harvest season because your sinuses will tell you. Um, but when it's getting close to harvest, 
you notice that there's places, these fields of cotton, where the ground has been tilled, it's been cultivated, it's been planted, it's been irrigated, and, and cotton grows up. But there's these other places beside the road, right? The place where my dad would stop and like that one time and pick cotton for us, it wasn't actually in the field. It was just kind of on the ditch on the side of the road. And while there was cotton growing there, that cotton was never going to be harvested, right? That cotton was never going to go into production, right? The cotton gins weren't going to go pick that cotton, in fact, if you looked at it compared to the cotton that was in the field, it wasn't very healthy. The bulbs on it were really small. Like, it's not cotton that you would necessarily want in production. And it was growing, but it wasn't growing to the potential that it would have if that seed would have been planted in the field. And I tell you that story because it really introduces this parable that Jesus tells that we're going to look at today in Luke chapter 8, verse 4. And this is what I want to read to you in Luke chapter 8, right? It says, and when a great crowd was gathering and the people from the town uh, after town came to him, he said in the parable, a sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot. And the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock. And as it grew, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among the thorns and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell in the good soil and yielded and grew and yielded a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, He who has ears, let him hear. And when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. And the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they heard the word, received it with joy. But these are not rooted. They believe for a while and in a time of testing fall away. As for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear. But as they go on their way, they are choked by their, by their cause or by their cares and riches and pleasures of life. And their fruit does not mature. And as for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. So we're going to talk about this passage this morning. So real quickly, I just kind of wanted to share with you guys um, and get some of your feedback, and it can be the same or different from first service, just so you know. Um, when I hear this, right, it's this last part of the last verse that sticks out to me, right? And bear fruit with patience. And I've, I've read this passage I don't know, a hundred times. I've heard teaching after teaching on it, right? This is not a new parable. It's actually one of Jesus' most known parables. Um, like it makes it in movies like uh, if anybody ever saw the movie or played Godspell way back in the day, right? This parable is in Godspell, right? That's like no one else, no one got it in this service either. Has anybody seen this? Am I the only one who's heard of the play Don't Godspell? <laughs> no, it's going to ruin the musical number at the end. <laughs> uh, no, uh, but in the parable, right? It's a known parable. And as I've read it, I don't know, hundred, probably really hundreds of times, it's really this, this first, this, this reading this week, as I've read through it, this last, this last phrase stuck out to me, and bear fruit with patience. Because as much as I want to be good soil and receive God's word, I also am not patient. And I even think there's some level that we've cultivated this idea in church of, hey, it's, it's sitcom church, right? We want to come in, we want to hear our message, we want to get our nugget, we want to do the good thing that we need to do this week and move on to next week. And I don't know if you've, if you've been in one of the services where I say, hey, this is not an easy concept, this is one we're going to have to sit with for, and wrestle with over time, right? I think there's more and more of these concepts, and I think it, it, it creates in us this need for patience and understanding God's Word. Last year, I actually spent a, a good season, like six weeks, in one book of the Bible, and a really short one, actually. And uh, I mean, it was like four pages, like really short. And so much so, like I am in this for six weeks and I read the book over and over and over and over again. And it's amazing what I learned from this, just sitting and being patient with God's word. And we actually do this thing, and a lot of churches do this. We actually don't, but a lot of churches do. And if you do, this isn't bad, but like there's this challenge to read through the Bible in a year. And I don't think it's bad. I think that's a good thing. My grandfather has done this every year of his life for way longer than I've been alive. Uh, but I also think there's something that if we're not trying to just move on to the next thing, when we sit 
and meditate on God's word and really are patient with these truths, I think it can do something in our hearts. I'm reminded of, of in Joshua 1, 8, where, uh, where this, this, the people of Israel are, are entering the Holy Land, are about to enter the Holy Land, and they're told, right, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. And there's this idea of patience, even within this verse, that, that I think when we are patient with God's word, and, and, and we do, we see more fruit come of it, right? When, when something is planted, like you don't just get the harvest immediately, you have to wait for it to grow. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, but the cultivation around that growth is so vital for it to have healthy growth. But then here's the, the, the thing that really stuck out to me for this, right? Patience, and you look at in, in Joshua 1, 8, but also in this parable of Jesus, patience leads to fortification so that what we then grasp and then we grow with, like we are stronger because of that patience. So what do you guys think? Comments on this or, or, or anything else? Jake, you started... <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I did not grow up in West Texas. That sounds very cool. Uh, I did grow up in the heart. Wasn't cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, hot. yeah, hot. Yeah. Uh, but I did grow up in the heart of Illinois, and we grow a lot of food in the heart of Illinois. So I'm not personally a farmer, but have lots of family and friends who are. And I have to confess. So when you talk about patience, when you talk about the receiver, what it reminds me of is in this parable there is a sort of first this picture of receiving God's word. And what I have to confess is that so often growing up reading this passage, I skipped that whole part. And what I heard in it when I read it is this missionary assignment. You know, oh, I get it. Jesus wants me to go out and to sow seeds of God's word. And I'm looking around at the different uh, people and the different soil conditions. And I completely skipped this idea that God first has a word in this parable for me to first acknowledge how fickle I can be as a seed receiver before ever considering the role of a sower. And so I have to get this in early on. I have this quote from Spurgeon. Josh loves Spurgeon, so I just want to say it first before he does it. Um, Steve hates Spurgeon. Yeah, yeah. Just kidding, he does. No, I just, I just knew. I figured Josh would try to throw in a Spurgeon quote, so I wanted to get it in early. Um, and, and Spurgeon said this, he said, as ministers of the gospel, which by the way, everyone in this room who follows Jesus is also a minister of the gospel. So that's everyone who follows Jesus. We have a responsibility to sow, but we have an equal responsibility to ensure that the word of God is first being sown and grown in us. That's what Spurgeon said. And that's convicting because I am sometimes totally hardened to God's word. Uh, sometimes I'm more like the rocky ground where I study God's word just enough to get through life group, but you know, it's not really <laughs> deep in me, right? Oh, I'm the only one that does that. Uh, or yeah, exactly. The thorny ground, like that, that gives me a picture of my own ability to be distracted all the time and how distracted I can be. And so I think the conviction, when you talk about being a receiver first or being a patient receiver, it's actually, I have to back up and go, wait a minute, this is not first and foremost a missionary assignment for me to go sow seeds into others. It's I need to examine, reflect on my own heart first and say, Lord, what soil condition am I in this moment. He's, Jesus is describing the erratic state of my heart. Yes, it is erratic. Thank you, Jacob. <laughs> Thank you, Jacob. Thank you Appreciate that. That's, 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 that's yeah. confirmation. Thank you. No, I think that's, that's spot on there, Jake. I think as, uh, as I shared in the first service as well, you know, sometimes we like, it's either, it's one or the other. We think it's one or the other. It's got to be this or that or this or that. And, and sometimes we're just really black and white, especially in Christianity. But in this particular passage of scripture, it lays out four different types of sto soil, and we can be those. Uh, it could be this, four different soils on the same day. Uh, right. It's just the way it works, <laughs> the, our emotions and everything that we're, we're facing and different things we got going on in our lives. And I think that's a, that's a great thought there, Jake is that um, 
we we're not necessarily one soil or the other. We always want to be the good soil, but uh, in reality, let's just face it, we're not. Right. Um, and we need that. We need that. We need that. We need that help. We need that cultivation. We need that encouragement. We need those uh, those people around us and those things in our life to help us uh, help us to to become that good soil um, and not get too choked up or worried uh, in the things of this world. So that's a really good. Topic. You know, you said something right about the emotions on that, right, and how our emotions sometimes impact. Have a good soil. And I think about what Jesus' explanation, talking about how sometimes we receive the word with joy. There's no depth to it, and so it's not cultivated or doesn't grow. And and I think that's important because you're right. Sometimes it is our emotions that set us off. It is our emotions that that change kind of how we receive something. Because when I'm I'm in a good mood, right? I have no problem. Like when I'm when I know that I am I'm I'm happy and receptive and my kids are being obedient and there's and, and you know i haven't done anything wrong to make my wife mad at me which is always my fault uh, that's a fact i am always to blame um and re- regardless right it's sometimes it's that emotion that that changes my heart and even in that day from a soil that's receptive to oh i had a bad day i don't want to hear it like i'm not i'm not willing to look at how i can grow like my heart immediately goes from from that good soil to then something that is not, and I lack patience in that moment probably too. No, that's good. And I want, I just want to share. This is going to be. I'm going to get real personal with you right now, and um, just bear with me. Um, speaking of patience and and different things like that, and hearing things, uh, you know, my wife and I and our family have been struggling with our, some things with our son, and uh, we had some bad news last week, you know, and it was just like, oh my gosh, uh, just one of those things where the emotions kick in. Um, but at the same time, I got my daughter and my son-in-law, they're going to Connecticut, so serving in a ministry, you know, and you get these ebbs and flows and you get this, oh yeah. And it's like, oh no, oh yeah. Oh no. It's a terrible roller coaster ride sometimes. Um, but I think, uh, uh, that, 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 that seed is, you know, sometimes we get so focused, uh, well, I do, especially if it's somebody else, especially my son thinking about, well, this is all about him. Uh, maybe it's not, <laughs> maybe yeah. it's me. Yeah. You know, maybe there's some things happen that God's working in my life, and He's using this situation, which I terribly dislike, uh, to actually, to actually do something in my life, and it's like, oh, I don't like that. <laughs> yeah, that's that's tough, um, but that's tough. But uh, but I uh, but I know that God's good. He's faithful. He's true, and and I can trust. Um, and Josh, you said something. You said something the the, the first service at the, when you were praying at the very end. You said something, and I can't. I'm going to paraphrase this, and I'm probably going to butcher it. Uh, but you said something something about our kids make our lives challenging. And I think you used some some different words like that. I think you even used the word like messed up. But um, uh, that's youth pastor language right there. But uh, which was right on the money. Uh, but this is what I, this is what I, this is the wonder of God, is that of all the people in this room, God spoke to me through that, singled me out, this is the way I feel, and he spoke to me directly, just by something you said, that God put in your heart. Because it's not something that we normally say or you didn't normally pray. And I thought, wow, that's how much God loves me. Is that there's, there's a ton of other people in this room. And God spoke to me. Me. And I thought, wow, what a wonderful God we serve. Amen. So let me ask you this, right? In those moments, um, in those moments that that require patience? Like what are, and, and Steve, I appreciate you sharing, maybe Jake or, or, or Josh, like what are those moments that you have had to lean into that patience piece with God, either while you're studying scripture or when God is trying to, to teach you something? Um, because I'm honest, like I am so impatient. Sometimes it just comes across as stubborn. And I always look back at these moments and go, oh, that's what he was trying to do. I'm an idiot. <laughs> I'm um, not saying that you guys are idiots. Um, I mean, you can say that if you want to. I'm not going to say that. Uh, but what are those moments maybe for you guys that, that you have had to lean into that patience and either study or patience in, in prayer, or patience in waiting for those seasons of growth and cultivation? Well, one thing that that makes me think of is, you know, Jesus, when he called his disciples, he said, come, follow me, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. 
And at that time, fishing was done with nets. But it also makes me think of, because I love to fish, and the modern way of fishing is with a rod and reel and a line. And oh, some, in Alabama, we fish with dynamite. Just well, <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> uh, but, but there's something to that with, with um, the approach. And, and sometimes you can, you can throw the same lure to the same location Ooh, and 30 times, and, and it's that 30th cast that just for whatever reason, the fish responds. And uh, I've seen that play out in so many ways. In uh, a previous church that we were at in another state, I, uh, I served on what we called the testimony team. And when we had, um, it was part of the membership process. When somebody would apply to become a member of the church, they would meet with a member of the testimony team so that we could hear their story, kind of get an idea of where they're at in their walk and, and, uh, and just hear how they came to Christ and how they came to our church. And I, through that, I got to hear so many different testimonies from people. And, and I see so much of this passage illustrated mm-hmm. in those examples because some people would say, you know, they were just kind of going through life, uh, just rooted in the world without, without a care, and all of a sudden somebody presents the gospel to them and they say, oh, I've never heard that before, but that's what I've been looking for. And they right. recognize in that moment that's what I've been missing, and they just respond. Other times I've heard so many testimonies from people who say they had a a parent or a sibling or a friend or a coworker that would invite them to church, that would invite them to a Bible study, that would share the gospel with them, and they, for whatever reason, were just so resistant to it. And for years, they just, you know, gave them the stiff arm. Nope, not doing it. You know, maybe they were just rebellious towards God. Maybe they, they had some hurt that they had to get to work through. Yeah. Uh, but there was always a, a moment where they just kind of came to the end of themselves. And in that moment where they just found themselves broken without any other options, they remember that person who constantly invited them. They remember that, and that's the first person they call. They say, okay, it's that I get it now. Cast. I'm ready, exactly. It's that 30th cast. And, uh, and we don't know. Yeah. You know, we, we don't know. So just keep, keep casting. Right, I keep mean, taking those opportunities. If I can't find something that I, if I can't find information immediately by Googling it, I didn't Google, I just tell the robot that lives on my phone to Google something for me and she does it. Right? If I can't have the information that I want at my hands immediately, like I'm just so frustrated and angry. And instead of leaning into that patience of, I mean, remember going to libraries to actually research something? <laughs> And like, it's like a treasure hunt and an adventure. When you found it, you were like, this is the information I needed. Like, no, I don't do that anymore. So Jake, what about you? The Dewey Decimal System. Is that what we're going to go to next? (laughs) Um, So that's the next series. Yeah. (laughs) You you asked like if there's a a passage of scripture and and there is one. So uh, this winter, it was Mark 2 for me that I just felt like I could not come out of that passage. It just, the Lord wouldn't let me off the hook from reading Mark 2. And this is the story of the four friends who lower the paralytic through the roof. And um, it's a simple story. So it was like, Lord, okay, what else do you have for me? Why do I have to keep reading this over and over again? And I don't have time to share with you why that particular passage is so meaningful to our family. Uh, But as you get into it, what you realize is... uh, so we, to come back, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to circle all the way back to your question. Uh, what you realize is everything can change in an instant. So in that passage, it doesn't have to be this long, drawn-out transformation process, right? So like come back to the sower for a minute. So often I think we look at these soils and we're like, yeah, I am the dry ground. Or we talk about a season of drought or a season where just things just don't seem right. And maybe you're in a season like that right now. But the way Jesus operates in his miraculous power is it doesn't have to happen incrementally. It doesn't have to be water, 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 water to get out of a season of drought. Mm-hmm. What, I re- what I realized when I was soaking in that passage is that everything can change in an instant. And ironically, the other passage that he won't let me out of right now is this one, the parable of the sower. And I'm like, okay, Lord, what is it about? Why am I so dense that you won't let me move on from this one? (laughs) But I think it's because I like to be strategic 
And I think I've always read this passage as like the parable of the strategic sower, right? Like go out and look for the fertile soil and that's where we should be sowing. But what I'm learning as I'm reading this passage is the Holy Spirit can go before us and transform the soil in an instant. So the conditions don't have to be pre-prepared for us to sow seeds of God's word. I serve in a ministry that ministers to incarcerated kids. And a lot of people would say, that's not strategic. That's not fertile soil. You know, society would say, those are throwaway kids. But I can tell you over and over again that the Holy Spirit goes before us and transforms the soil in an instant. It doesn't have to be incremental. It doesn't have to be this long period of transformation. Jesus can do it in a moment for them, for me, and for us. And so maybe, I guess one of the lessons I'm learning is it's not the parable of the strategic sower. It's the parable of the generous sower who sows generously in us and to those around us, knowing that by his power, he can transform the soil in any moment. Steve, in the first service, you mentioned uh, if you could rename it, you would rename it something else, that parable. What, what did you what did you say? Oh, in the, in, the, in the headers of our Bibles, it says the par- parable of the sower, when, when in reality, the way, you know, looking, thinking that we're talking, is probably more apropos to call it the, the parable of the soils. Uh, it's talking about the soils, our hearts, our receptiveness, what we are, uh, how we receive it. Um, um, but yeah, that's because the sower is always there, but it's how it's received is really, really what the, you know, that parable is talking about. So the parables of the soil, I want to have that tender heart. Right. You know, I want to be that. I want to be that. So that's what, that's what I want to be. And another thing I think um, is that going back to what we mentioned in the first service is the seed never changes. Seed is always the same. Always, always, always the same. And that's such good news, isn't it? There's yeah. a lot of variables in this, in this story, a lot, of, a lot of different things and different ways it can go, but the sower sows the seed, the Word of God, which never changes. And that's where our hope is, is that this never changes. Uh, this might, this doesn't, this aligns with this. And that's, that's a powerful thing. It's yeah, there's, a powerful and the seed has purpose, right? It's not purposeless. It, like its purpose is to grow. Yep. And our purpose is to be the ground that's cultivated, right? Um, but sometimes we also see that, that that cultivation takes place in varying forms. Uh, during first service, I was actually, we're talking about this, and my dad actually texted me while I was up here. And it was like, hey, don't forget, like in the first century, when they would cultivate the ground, sometimes they would plant the seed first, and then they would take the rocks out. And then they would take the weeds, and then they would till around it. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily go in the same order as we do today, uh, but it doesn't change the purpose of the seed that's being planted. And we think you're right. I mean, it's, sometimes we expect it to be kind of that that drought takes forever to end. But look, in Texas, when we had a drought, we would when we had prayer meetings and pray for rain to end the drought. Um, but when the drought ended, it wasn't usually like like a, a year that ended it. What we what we took was a huge downpour, and it was a moment. Yes. And in it, it, that seed, right, or the ground in the drought would find like rejuvenation, right? It's for us. It's that moment that 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 our hearts change and are more receptive. And then the, the purpose of the seed, right, to grow is now not in the rocky soil. It's not being trampled. It's not shallow. It's not being choked out. Now it's in the cultivation to grow. And when we are patient to get that, right. If, if, it, if it takes, you know, the seasons and the years of, of sitting through the same passage, or it's that moment, it's that 30th cast. When, when that moment happens, like, it, it, transformation happens, right? It doesn't, it doesn't require another 30 years. It's the moment. But sometimes it's, it's those, it's not just us being patient, but it's those around us that make a difference. And Josh, you had something, a uh, perspective on this that I liked uh, about that, that cultivation and kind of not just us, but those around us that, that make an impact too. Yeah, and that's one of the things I love about this passage and why I think it works so well for the format that we're in is, is because you can take multiple approaches. And it's not because the passage has multiple competing interpretations, right. but because it has multiple useful applications. Yeah. And, and that's what makes this passage so good because... We can read it one day and and see ourselves as the soil. We can read it another day and see ourselves as the sower. And that both are true. 
because while we, each of us is a, a soil, we are also called for the work of, of the service of God's kingdom. And so we are also the sower. And another thing that's interesting is the ESV translation that we read off of, it says that a sower went out to sow. There are other translations that say a farmer went out to sow seed in his field. And so there are also a different days that farmer's focusing on different things. The day that he has the sack of seed over his shoulder is the day he's focused on sowing the seed. But there will be another day where he's got the plow and he's out there to plow the field. And, uh, and it just makes me think of um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says, for what is Paul or what is Apollos, but only servants through whom you came to believe as God has apportioned each his task. Uh, I, I planted the seed, this is Paul speaking, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God was the one who made it grow. Therefore, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. And so there are two very important things I get from that. One is the freedom of knowing that I'm not going to be judged based on the output of the soil. That's God's work. You know, as Jake said, that's the Holy Spirit is, is the one that has the power to work in the soil to worry about the production. All, I, all I'm going to be judged on is my faithfulness in the task that God's put in front of me. And the other thing I, I see from that is we all have different roles to play. And, um, and some of those people that, you know, those I was talking about earlier with their testimony, and they had s- someone in their life that was playing the part of the plower, someone who is the tiller, someone who is the seed sower, someone who is the irrigator. It's a process. Yeah. And, and sometimes it can happen in an instant. Sometimes it is a long drawn out process. It's always the Holy Spirit at work, but God gives us a great honor in being a part of someone's story in that way. And it's not always, in, the, the burden doesn't fall on us to get somebody all the way there in one conversation, mm-hmm. in one moment. Yeah. Sometimes our role is different with different people, but we all have a part to play. Yeah. What I love about how you're describing those acts of faithfulness is that, I mean, you were very clear. It's growth that's, growth is God's agenda, not ours. So we have a, a role to play in the faithfulness of the cultivation, but God's not uh, contingent on us doing the exact right thing at the exact right time. We, we get to play a role. We get to play a role with joy in faithfulness. And so um, I had breakfast with a friend this week who is studying God's unfailing love for us. And he challenged me uh, in this regard where he said, uh, you know, Jake, when you wake up in the morning, you probably are working through the to-do list. Here's all the things that I got to do today, whether it's plant, (coughs) water, you know, it doesn't quite look like that. But thinking through all the emails that need to be responded to and all the actions that need to take place. He said, Jake, I challenge you to not get out of bed in the morning until you have come to grips with the fact that Christ loves you regardless of what you do today or don't do today. So do not get out of bed until you have come to grips. Don't worry about your list. Don't think about the actions that need to take place. Do not get out of bed today until you have come to grips with the fact that Jesus loves you regardless of what you do or don't do today. And so what you're describing there is this joy that we get to play in cultivation, in sowing, but growth is God's agenda alone, and it is a joy to participate. I love that we are grown into something, too, right? And, and, and I love this idea that we each have these roles to play. I shared this first service, right? There was a, a, a Bible teacher that I had uh, in high school. Actually, if you didn't know, like, I started like my biblical education uh, formally in seventh grade. I went to a Christian uh, middle school, high school, then college, and a couple different seminaries, right? So I've had a lot of like formal Bible teaching, which by the way, when you have a uh, scripture memory for a homework assignment, really kind of puts a weird taste in your mouth for memorizing scripture for spiritual growth. Um, actually, in D3, we talk, I talked about that, how that was difficult for me to get over. Um, but there was this high school Bible teacher that I had in 10th and 11th grade, and his name was David Halliday. And the man just knows the Bible front ways and back ways. And he did something for me, right? He helped cultivate in my heart a different desire to study scripture. And I was, you know, I was already a good Christian youth group kid at the time. Like, I love Jesus. I want to read my Bible to grow. But like, there was a hunger that I had because he did something else to cultivate the soil of my heart that I wanted to receive it, but I wanted to like 
grow in it. Like I wanted to know more. I wanted to study more. I wanted to dive in. I wanted to understand what Greek and Hebrew said about it. And uh, I mean, it was huge, huge for me. Um, but the other thing that, that as you, you were talking about kind of those different roles, and we're talking about this agriculture, agriculture analogy that we do see all through Scripture, right? Agricultural analogies. There's one of them that even talks to, about that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And we've also got to realize that it is God's job to make it grow, but he, our job is not passive. Our job is an active participation in this. And uh, like even today, right? We've been announcing our Easter's coming up. So every time Easter's coming up, we usually do some type of kids ministry training and, and uh, volunteer training. But, but here's the truth behind those trainings. We do that because we know there's going to be a bunch of people and we want to have you know, our volunteers in place. But the real heart behind that is the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And we need people who are willing to, to, to serve in different, different capacities. And maybe it is at Lighthouse. Maybe the harvest is different. Maybe the harvest is the coworkers you sit with. I mean, y- you guys even know more than me. You guys know more than me. I mean, my coworkers are Josh and Caroline. We get together. We talk about Jesus a lot, right? Uh, it's like <laughs> the harvest is not plentiful in my workplace. Uh, there seems to be a workplace full of workers. So we got to go out to find the harvest. But, but many of you guys, I mean, that harvest is the desk or cubicle or office next to you. It's the people you run into. You guys work together. That's funny. I know you're looking at each other like, uh, y'all work at the same place. Um, but, but I mean, where is that harvest in your life? Like, where, where is that? And if it's serving here, great. 2 p.m. today, we're having a training. And at either noon, 1 or 2 p.m. next week, we're going to have another training. Uh, and, and we need those workers at our church, but we need those workers in our community, too. This very next words, the challenge is pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. Yes. So like that is the action and faithfulness, right? And when I'm at my best, that's what I'm doing. Praying earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. When I'm at my worst, it looks like I'm a frantic person running around trying to duct tape fruit to the vine. And that doesn't (laughs) like, and then I'm like, look, Lord, aren't you impressed with what I did? And there is a difference, you know, in faithfulness or in uh, production. So we just have just a couple minutes left. So anything any last minute thing you guys want to want to share? I like duct tape. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Is that for the closing thought? That's a good thought. That's a good thought. I mean, just one thing that I, I had heard uh, somebody say, and it really resonated with me in connection with this passage. They said, you know, when you're when you're sowing seeds, if you find that you need to bring a hammer as part of the process. <laughs> you're probably going about it wrong. Uh. And, and what that basically means is, you know, in this example, uh, to your point, the sower is just to sow the seed generously and not try to be strategic about worrying of what kind of soil am I throwing it into, but also at the same time, not going and trying to pound the, sa- the, the seed into the path, the hard soil. Um, that's, that's a different function for another day that involves the Holy Spirit. Um, and so if you find yourself getting stressed out because you're spending too much time trying to pound that seed into it somewhere that's not taking it, move on. It's okay. That's good. Um, so, you know, even going into this, we weren't entirely sure how we were going to close it out. And then Jake mentioned that first service. I want to mention it again uh, in this service. Is what, what he said about that challenge that before you get out of bed every morning, um, recognize that that you're saved and God loves you regardless of what you accomplish. Um, yeah, I was convicted by that. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but every morning when I wake up, like in the morning, my first alarm goes off and I snooze that like four times. My wife hates that, by the way. Um, and then I finally get out of bed and my next thought or my next action is I'm looking at my phone or all the emails for work I've already gotten for the day. And my to-do list starts to form. My kids aren't even up and I'm already in, in my mindset thinking about work. And based on an email I get before my feet hit the floor, it can entirely change my mood and even make me receptive or unreceptive. It can change the type of soil I am for the day. Um, And so I love that. So here's my challenge. I'm going to do this and I'm going to ask you to do it too, right? This week, before you look at your phone, before you look at your to-do list, before your feet hit the ground, recognize that moment that regardless of what you accomplish, regardless of the good or the bad, Jesus loved you enough to die for you and 